I think we'll begin the, the webinar now. Um, I'll, I'd like to introduce myself. My name's David. I will be uh, doing the introduction, telling you a little bit about the university um, in general. And um, several of my colleagues will also be speaking. Uh, as I said, I'm going to be speaking about UMU University in general. And then my colleague Gwen will be speaking about student tips. Uh, Christopher will be talking about uh, scholarships and tuition fees. Um, and then Francine will be talking about the admissions process and how to apply entry requirements. And we'll also be taking questions at the end. And again, if you want to ask questions in the chat, in the Q&A, do it in the Q&A. So here's some general information about UMU University. We have about 37 enrolled students, and that's at the undergraduate, um, master's, and PhD level, and approximately 3,600 are international. So uh, it's, it's a very multi multicultural campus. We have 40 degree programs taught in English, as well as 450 individual single subject courses. Um, and we are a multidisciplinary comprehensive university with four faculties uh, in arts, social sciences, science and technology, and medicine. And we have approximately 60 nationalities represented, represented uh, among our teachers, researchers, and students. So uh, you will meet people from all over the world here on campus. And I'll tell you a little bit about the main campus, which we call Campus Umeo. It's uh, where most of the courses and programs are held, and it's quite large. I'd, I'd like to say it, it takes about 30 minutes to walk around the perimeter of the campus, and it's about the size of 34 football pitches to get an idea of how big it is. And in the middle of the campus is a pond, and it's a great hangout place. Throughout the year in the spring and fall, you can look at the ducks. And in the winter, they actually they make it into an ice skating rink. So uh, that's kind of the central part of the campus. And we are within walking distance of downtown Umeo. It takes maybe 20 minute walk and a 10 minute bike ride. And you're in the center of town with all the shops and restaurants. We have another campus, which is called the Umeo Arts Campus, down by the Umeo River, and it's less than two kilometers from the main campus. And this is where our top-ranked Umeo Institute of Design is, Umeo School of Architecture, uh, Academy of Fine Arts, and we have a very um, renowned art museum, contemporary art museum called Bild Museet, and a science center that is open recently called Curiosum. And here are some of our, our master degree programs uh, by subject area. Uh, we have architecture, design, fine arts, business and economics, science, technology, and engineering, health and medicine, social sciences, and humanities. And you will find all of these master's programs on our, on our website. If you go into the homepage and click edu education, you'll, you'll see them. And the application period is now open, of course. We'd also like to share with uh, a lot of pride that we are, are very highly ranked when it comes to uh, international student satisfaction. Um, we have participated in something called the International Student Barometer, and we've had very high scores in our, our social activities. We have a buddy program, which Gwen is going to talk about. We have excellent IT access, uh, quick Wi-Fi, and when it comes to sports facilities, we have Sweden's largest uh, indoor gym called Iksu. Um, so we've done very well in this ranking. We're proud of that. As I mentioned, Buddy Program is one of our really great projects we have. It's basically an easy way to get a, an introduction to Sweden and Umeå where you can make friends really quickly and do lots of fun things. Um, and the way it works is we have Swedish students as they act as buddies 
and you are placed in a group where they do lots of fun things and they coordinate many activities. So uh, it's extremely popular and uh, we hope you join it if you are admitted. Um, we also have great and uh, mo uh, modern facilities on campus. Um, it's a dynamic and open culture uh, and really top notch facilities with uh, just, we have a lot of group study rooms as you see in the photos and easy access to whiteboards and monitors. And so you can work in teams. There's a lot of group project work here at the university. So it makes it easier to uh, collaborate. And we couldn't uh, forget to mention the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2020, which was uh, Professor Emmanuel Charpentier who made the discovery of CRISPR-Cas9 right here on campus Umeo, together with uh, colleagues in the United States. And she always claimed that she had, this was a great environment to do research because it was very collaborative and we had the infrastructure for her. And she had a lot of freedom to do, to do daring things on campus. So uh, this was a proud moment for the university. Um, uh, I'll talk a little about accommodation. We have um, student, a student housing service that offers housing to exchange students and degree students that are paying a tuition fee to study at the university. So if you um, apply to a degree program and you're outside of Europe, um, you will have the chance to get housing through our accommodation service. And it's usually a um, single occupancy room where you share a kitchen with other um people in your in your corridor as we like to say and you have your own bathroom and toilets they're, they're and they're furnished with beds and dressers uh, and a desk and they're very close to campus they're all within 20 minute walking distance to campus um or or a short parking ride and i mentioned are the largest gym in sweden or training facility this this is one of the largest also in in northern europe throughout Europe and it's kind of a city in itself, as you can, as you would say, there's everything there, including a swimming pool, um, wall climbing, many, many types of classes you could take. And uh, there's even a beach volleyball uh, court. And uh, there's really something for everyone there. Um, and it's a popular place to hang out off campus. It's actually on campus. And a little short about the city of Umeå. We are the largest city in Northern Sweden, and it's one of the fastest growing cities in the country. We now have over 130,000 inhabitants here. And we like to say that people who are not born here and come here like to stay here. So as you can see, 54% of the residents were not born here. So we have a lot of transplants from all over Sweden and throughout the world that have come to live and work in, in Umeå and study. Um, and it's a great city with lots of uh, culture, history, uh, an active city life, sport. Uh, there's a lot of nature nearby. We like hiking and winter sports. Uh, and it's very easy to get around. We have an excellent um, bus system where you can get from any part of town within 30 minutes without any problem. Okay, now I'd like to hand it over the baton to my to my colleague Gwen. Hi, so I'll be here giving some uh, information about what it was like for me as an international student here. So I thought maybe I'd begin by explaining who I am and how I came to be uh, a student at Umeå. So I first came to Umeå in 2016 uh, when I was an Erasmus student and I did my full year abroad, my exchange year here at Umeå. Uh, I then went home to graduate and then I really, really missed Umeå and I decided to come back again in 2018. So I returned as a, a European master's student. So a free mover, we call them. Uh, I chose Umeå again because of the great experiences I had here as an international student and also because of the quality of teaching and education within my field. Uh, it's ranked really highly in what I choose, uh, chose to study. So 
that was a big driving force of coming back. So I thought maybe I'd give some information about uh, how I experienced Umia. And um, I would describe Umia as a city of two halves where you have summer and you have winter. Um, half the year is summer and the other half is winter. So you might have heard about the dark and the cold in Northern Sweden. Um, but first I thought I'd begin with a little bit of information about what summer's like, as if you did choose to come study here, you'd likely uh, begin in summer. Uh, so yeah, these are some pictures from summer. Uh, summer in Umeå is really, really beautiful, and it was actually surprisingly pretty warm, which I think you can see in these pictures. Uh, my personal favourite activity to do is to go on long walks. Uh, the photo on the left here is from an area called Arboretum, which is kind of in the western side of Umeå. It's a bit of a walk or a bike ride to get there, but it's a stunning walk on a really nice warm day. Um, I also love to swim, uh, again, seen in these photos. There's uh, plenty of places to go swimming in Umeå. You can go swimming in the lake, which is where these two photos are, or you can swim at certain points in the river, but it's a bit more dangerous. So there's certain safe spots that you can go to. Um, or you can also go to the coast, which is a, a long bike ride or a medium distance drive. Um, and there are also some beaches nearby, uh, but you would need to drive to those. But other things you can do here in summer, kind of the usual, uh, sit in parks, uh, sit by the river and eat ice cream. There's always ice cream vans. Uh, enjoy the outside serving places of bars and restaurants. Uh, there's even a boat restaurant here that specifically is open in summer uh, because the weather and the ambience is so nice here. So um, there's plenty to do in summer, even though it is a, a city in the north where you expect it to be cold and wintry the whole year which moves us on to winter. Um, I am a little biased here because winter is my favorite season, which was a big reason um, that I chose Umeå was to experience a, a proper winter. Um, winter probably begins somewhere around late October, November. Um, and that's when it starts to get dark pretty early and where the ice begins to form at night. Uh, so winter can be the most tough, but also the most beautiful and kind of rewarding time of year here. Um, especially your first winter. I still talk about and still remember my very first winter here in Umeå, and I don't think that will ever change no matter how long I stay here. Um, and then some activities you can do in winter. I do have some more pictures from winter actually, maybe we can. So these are what they look like. So you can go for hikes when it looks like this or like this, <laughs> or the third picture. Uh, so in winter, you can go for walks in the forest, which you see in these photographs. Uh, no matter kind of what the day looks like, whether it's a sunny day or a kind of grey, dreary day, it's still just as beautiful, I think. Um, you can cross country ski, you can go ice bathing, you can walk on the frozen lakes, obviously be very careful with that. Um, basically, life still goes on here in winter. I'm from a country where uh, if it snows even a little bit, the whole country shuts down but it, that's really not the case here. Uh, you still carry on life as normal, no matter how much snow or ice there is, which is a, a really cool thing to experience. I think that's really special. Um, one of the most important aspects of winter here in Umeå is dressing well. So if we go to the next slide, I have a photo with some tips about what to pack and buy for winter. And if you look on the left there, the jumpers closet is actually my own personal closet. So that's all the jumpers that I have to survive winter. <laughs> so the most important thing to do here is to dress well and to really prepare yourself well. There's a, a well-known Swedish phrase that Swedes love to tell you if you complain that you're cold. They say, which means there's no bad weather, only bad clothing. And you will hear that a lot if you choose to study here. Um, so it's therefore super important to invest in proper winter clothes, a proper coat, a proper boots, uh, keep your feet really warm. And it would be important to either buy those in your home country or you can also buy them here for some discounted prices and stuff. We have some shops that specialize in this, but this is a really important aspect of surviving winter. And that's me by a frozen waterfall uh, in Jämtland in uh, Western Sweden, where it gets just as cold as Umeå, if not colder. And I still look like I'm having fun. I was having fun despite the weather. So, yeah. And if we move on to spring and autumn, I was over exaggerating a little bit earlier. We do have uh, four seasons. They're just not as 
long as, uh, as summer and winter. But spring and autumn here are also really, really beautiful, uh, especially when the weather's good, if it's a, a nice bright day or if uh, it's not raining or a bit icy. Um, and also the region of Umeå, the kind of local council, offers so many activities for you to enjoy, especially during um, kind of the more tough seasons. So you can see on the photo of the right on the right here, uh, this is from a, a kind of, I guess, art exhibition, you could call it, called um, Hust Jus, uh, or the Autumn Lights Festival, which will actually begin uh, this year uh, on Friday. And it's where the municipality light up the whole of the city centre with different uh, art installations and art projects, all made of light. And it's um, artworks created by local artists. So the region of Umeå really invests a lot into making uh, the tough times here a bit better and to brighten up the dark evenings. So, yeah. One of uh, an unexpected, I would say, actually, aspect of coming here was the new opportunities to travel. I think because Umeå is pretty far north, a lot of people think, oh, you need to travel down south or you need to go to Stockholm to be able to get anywhere. But there are actually a lot of new places that I don't think I would have ever been to if I hadn't moved here because I was so far away from the more popular tourist areas. So the two photos here on the left are from uh, places maybe a little bit closer to Umeå within driving distance. Um, the photo on the left with the boat is from a lake called Tavukla, uh, which I would say is maybe an hour's drive, I'm not sure, away from here. Um, and you can go swim in summer, you can ice bathe in winter, you can cross country ski in winter. It's also quite a popular location to go and hike and also to look at the Northern Lights, uh, I think, because it's quite a low polluted area. So I think a lot of people tend to head out in that direction. Uh, the second photo is from an island called Norbihar, uh, which is a really popular location in summer. It doesn't look like summer in that photo, but it was, I think, early August. <laughs> um, and yeah, it's a, prop, a popular kind of mini break or staycation uh, island for people who live in this area. Uh, the two pictures to the right are a bit further away, but they're new interesting places that I don't think I would have gone if I hadn't have moved here. So the photo with the reindeer is from Pajala, which is a city in the far north, uh, close to the border with Finland. Uh, I went there on a research opportunity uh, when I studied my master's. And yeah, it was absolutely stunning to see an even smaller place than Umeå and to experience a bit more of the, I guess, country lifestyle here in Sweden. It was really, really once in a lifetime experience, I would say. And then the photo on the far right is from Trondheim in Norway. Uh, me and some friends rented a car and uh, drove all the way to Trondheim and spent a few days there, which is a very popular thing to do when you're here as an international student. The international students love to go travel and to rent a car and just go somewhere else for the weekend. And I think it's encouraged. And yeah, it's a great way to see new and interesting places uh, within Scandinavia. And yeah, on the next slide, we have some of my favorite activities to do in Umeå. So the first is to go and watch the Northern Lights. Uh, there's a very popular Facebook group here where if you uh, do get admitted and choose to come study at Umeå, you need to join the Facebook group Aurora Hunters. They give tips and tricks on when the aurora is particularly strong and where you should go see it, which area has less light pollution than others. Um, this is a football field, uh, kind of a little bit to the outskirts of the city. I won't give the exact location because nobody is ever there when I'm there. So I want to keep that to myself, <laughs> but um, it's a, a really incredible experience. And you can probably see the Northern Lights here from, from my experience, late August until maybe early December. Uh, that's the busiest uh, season for it, I would say. Um, but yeah, you never know, I guess. Uh, and then the next activity, uh, this is from a student orchestra called Snarsvanget, uh, which means uh, the snow swingers, like jazz uh, music. Um, it was a student orchestra where we just played a lot of fun songs, some Swedish, some international, uh, but there are multiple student clubs. Uh, there's a theatre association, uh, there's a lot to do with amnesty and to do with kind of political rights. And I would say there's probably a student club for everyone. Uh, but this was one that I chose. I'm a bit more musically inclined. And then another, as I mentioned earlier, another thing that I love to do is to go hiking. So this photo was taken in Skulaskogen, 
which is a, a national park, I think, to the south of Umia. It was a friend of mine who drove, so I'm not sure. But um, yeah, we spent a weekend hiking uh, in a national park and it was really, really cool. I would definitely recommend doing it if you did come here. And the final photo, uh, this was somewhere out to the coast. I can't remember where again, but um, me and a friend of mine went kayaking and that was really cool. And yeah, it was nice to be able to do something, a summer activity, uh, which was nice. Yeah, and the final slide is the buddy program. Uh, mentioning activities, a lot of the activities that you would do if you came to study here would be uh, tied with the buddy program. So as David mentioned, uh, it works where um, there's between six and 10 Swedes in a group or uh, already established students at Umeå University, um, but the majority of them are Swedes uh, who are responsible for a group of international students. And the Swedish students are called buddies and the buddies are responsible for organizing a multitude of different activities for the internationals within their group. So uh, these photos are from uh, something called the photo scavenger hunt where uh, each group gets a list of pictures and uh, of um, prompts sorry and you have to take pictures for all the prompts and it's just a fun way to get to know your group and then the beach volleyball tournament uh, there's a, a laser dome placed in Umeå that's very popular for the buddy groups uh, some groups went berry picking a lot of groups go hiking or have grills by the lake and also the buddy program organizes a trip to the moose farm every semester as well so this is an integral part of being an international student in Umeå, I would say. I genuinely believe if it weren't for the buddy program, I don't think I would have come back to study here again. So if you did come study here, definitely join the buddy program. I think you'll make friends for life and it'll make your experience here all the better. Yeah. Thank you, Gwen. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, start with talking about the tuition fees. And as I said before, my name is Christopher Jonsson Becklund and together with my colleague Ingrid Stor, we uh, work with the tuition fee paying students and the scholarships at the Umeå University. I will now go through some of the things that might be useful for you to know in this area. Uh, and you may switch slides. Who is requi required to pay? Well, citizens from outside the EU, EEA or Switzerland are uh, normally uh, eligible for paying tuition fee. There are some ex exceptions to this general rule and uh, you can find the information on the university admissions page, which uh, students might not be able uh, or not be demanded to pay the tuition fee. Uh, if you believe that you are uh, not able, not uh, um, required to pay the tuition fee, then you need to upload those supporting documents at the university admissions pay page when you apply for the program, so they can make the assessment in the beginning. Uh, the next question is, uh, what do I pay? And that information is available at the bottom of the page of the program or the course uh, which you have chosen to study and uh, you will also find this information at the university admissions page when you search for courses and program they will state the cost the first cost that needs to be paid is the application fee that is 900 swedish crowns and that is for all universities in sweden that is just to get your application processed and determined if you are eligible for uh, the program that you have uh, applied for. The other fee, the tuition fee, the total fee is all, always uh, stated and then we have a uh, tuition fee per installment and the first one in this picture is 46,500 Swedish crowns and that amount is reoccurring all the semester for that program and uh, the amount for uh, the first installment and the total fee will differ depending on what program or course you are studying. Uh, paying the tuition fee, as I stated, the total amount is divided into separate installments, one for each semester. Uh, each uh, invoice for new students are sent out in April and there are also sent separate instructions on how to pay the invoice. They are coming from two different emails. And the due date, uh, here it says the 10th of June. However, now the next year, it will be the 12th of June since the 
10th of June is a, uh, a Saturday. So, um, but it is very important that if you intend to come and study at the university, try to pay the invoice as soon as possible. There are always some kind of delay when making international transactions. And also it, it helps you when you apply for the residence permit to get it processed as quick as possible, which leads to the Swedish Migration Agency. The <coughs> Swedish uh, Migration Agency will only uh, start to process the case, the, the application for the residence permits once this tuition fee has been paid for the course or the program. So if you pay uh, and, and we will receive the money, we will notify the Swedish Migration Agency that, that you have paid for the courses and the programs and you can apply in, in the same moment that you get the uh, receipt for the payment confirmation from us. And if you want to know more how the process of uh, applying for a resident permit in Sweden, you have the Study in Sweden official YouTube channel, which uh, have a live stream describing the application process at the Swedish Migration Agency. Uh, we cannot, as a university, ask answer questions about the residence permit once you have applied for it uh, we need to refer you to the migration agency and by phone or email scholarships we there are different kinds of scholarships that you can apply for both from the UMU university and from other providers at this webinar we will mainly focus on the scholarships given by the UMU university <clears throat> The available to students are for our master programs. Uh, they are covered partially or fully uh, tuition fees. And the application opens up in the mid-January after the, the admission uh, rounds closes. The selection is based on merit, uh, the academic merits. <clears throat> you can find the latest information about UMA University Scholarship on our website. Uh, the, it's not possible to give any notice in advance regarding the specific merits that will lead to a scholarship. Since the applicant's academic merits varies from year to year, it's difficult to know in what level of achievements that a student must have this specific year to be selected for a scholarship. The, to be eligible for a, a UMU University scholarship, you must be a citizen uh, of a country outside the EU, EEA, and Switzerland. You must have completed an application for the studies at master level before the application deadline of 16th January, January 2023, and you must have paid the application fee and turned in the supporting documents by the 1st February at the latest. You also need to have UMI University programs as your first priority at the university admissions website. Uh, the students that are deemed eligible for uh, a scholarship will receive an invitation to apply for the scholarship uh, via email shortly after the admission round process closes. No reference or letters of motivations are required for scholarships at our university. Uh, we have Oh, sorry, I thought it was a picture between those two. But <clears throat> the other scholarships are the Swedish Institute scholarships, uh, which offers a range of scholarships. Uh, we will post a link to their homepage in the chat. And you be advised that they have a different timeline regarding the application process than the, the one we have. The next application rounds for the Swedish Institute opens in February 2023. Uh, you also may find information about other available scholarships via the uh, Swe Study in Sweden websites, and we will also post a link to that one in uh, the chat. So you may go in there and see what other scholarships we have. If you have scholarships in your own country that you can apply for, that can also be a possibility. Uh, I would just like to uh, say that if you have a, a national scholarship that you apply for from your home country, do inform us that you, if you're waiting for uh, a war results for that when the, when the time is um, due for the payment of the invoice, if you have not finalized it. And then I'm uh, ready to work, uh, to talk about work and studies.
and tuition fee paying students uh, who play and plan to come and study full time in Sweden, they need a residence permit. Uh, the requirement to get the resident permit is that the student uh, has been admitted to the full-time studies and that they have uh, sufficient funds for their study period in Sweden. So uh, as studies in Sweden can be challenging, we do not recommend that students come to Sweden to work during their studies, but that they focus on their studies, at least to begin with. It could be quite difficult also to get a job in Sweden uh, as Swedish is often a requirement for getting jobs. Uh, we just want to reiterate that the studies needs to be the main priority. If a student does not manage their studies, they uh, run the risk of losing their resident permit. Uh, students uh, that have questions about working in Sweden can contact the Swedish Public Employment Service and students that have questions on how working may affect their resident permit can contact the Swedish Migration Agency. Yeah, and now I think it's my turn. <laughs> uh, Thank um, you, Christoph. Uh, oh, I'm just you. gonna uh, interrupt before you start, Francini. We had a very good question um, about uh, scholarships and I wasn't sure, maybe, maybe Christopher can answer. It was a student that wondered if they applied to two programs at the university, at UMI University, ranked one and two, and they were admitted to choice two. Are they still eligible for a scholarship? Uh, I, it seems like Jessica is typing an answer at this moment. So I don't want, don't know if he wants to give it in written, but I would say that yes, you're still eligible for a, a scholarship you, if you have applied for two uh, different programs at our university. Okay, mm -hmm. great, thank uh, you so much. Can I add on, because I saw that the question said that the person had applied for two courses. So it's important to remember that scholarships are only available for master's programs. So yes. not for eligible courses or single subject courses, all right? So if it's two programs that you're talking about, then is um, yeah, then is what Christopher said. Right, I think it's my turn. <laughs> Thank you, Christopher, and all other my other colleagues that were talking previously. Uh, I will give you a little time to get used to my accent. So you see, we are quite international university, not only international students. We have a, a whole lot of international staff as well. Uh, and now that you have heard a lot about UMI University, you have heard about living at university, uh, what the facilities we have, uh, all the good things, the, the, the prices university has uh, got, uh, and the programs that we have, and how nice it is to be here in the winter, <laughs> as Gwen said, and that we also offer scholarships. I hope that you are really keen to apply to UMI University and perhaps are wondering um, how you do that. So this is what, what I'm gonna talk about, how to apply to UMU University. So I'll start by commenting the, the picture that you see in the screen now. Uh, and you can see it's just a screenshot uh, shot from uh, two different websites. Uh, the, the website to the left is UMA University website, and the website to the right is uh, University Admissions website. And you, University Admissions, you have heard it before, and I see there are some people that have already applied, uh, but I would like to explain that University Admissions is a national application portal where you're going to apply for courses and programs all over Sweden. Also, not only UMO University, but if you're looking into other universities as well, you're gonna find uh, courses and programs there. What is the good thing? Uh, let's say that you are researching uh, courses and programs at UMO University, and then you found that wonderful master's program in chemistry that you would like to apply for. Uh, then when you find that master's program uh, and there will be an application button there, I'm going to show you this a little bit later, really hands on showing the website, but uh, those pages are interconnected. So it doesn't matter where you start your search, uh, you are going to end up at university admissions when you apply for a, a course or a program. So those websites are really important. Uh, UMA University, uh, www, uh, umu 
university.sc and university admissions is uh, universities university admissions altogether.sc so you find those two websites very important uh, we can go on to the next page and as david mentioned before we have over 40 degree programs entirely taught in english uh, and most of them are actually master's programs. Uh, we have only two available programs in this application round, in this admission round, uh, they are undergraduate programs. <clears throat> so most of the programs that we offer are uh, in English are master's program. But we also have uh, offer of a lot of uh, single subject courses that you can apply for uh, entirely taught in English. Well, when you apply, uh, as David mentioned, uh, there is already uh, an admission process going on. Uh, it opened up, this admission round opened up in October 17th. Uh, it's gonna be closed on January the 16th. And uh, this is the application deadline. So when you have to select your courses, if you're applying to masters, uh, or to uh, undergraduate programs, you select your courses, and then uh, you have to be uh, have clicked on the button apply uh, and submit your application by January 16. But then you have uh, up until February, the first of February, to submit your documents, your supporting documents. So. If you are in the last year of your undergraduate studies and want to apply uh, for a master's program, you still can do it, even if you're not done by February uh, 1st, okay? So there is still time between January and February to gather all the documents, especially if you're in, in need of an English test to uh, prove eligibility in English. Uh, you still have a month there, uh, uh, roughly a few days to until you have the deadline for submitting your uh, your documents and then uh, the selection results come in march 30 uh, the 30th of march and then uh, the 5th of april the selection results for bachelor's uh, programs uh, will be published and then the semester will start uh, on august 28th so a lot of people ask, but why do we start so early? You know, it's roughly uh, a little less than a year uh, before you start your classes. Uh, so the whole application process is quite long. And this is uh, because people that are applying uh, from abroad that need to apply for that uh, student resident permit, they will need time to get this uh, processed. So the, there is time, uh, the migration uh, board takes a little time. Sometimes it can take up to three months. And uh, from what we've heard, there, there are new regulations that it might be possible that you all will have to uh, go to an embassy, uh, a Swedish embassy to verify uh, your identity. So it can take time. So you gotta be prepared for that. Just take a look of all the instructions in the migration offices uh, at the web page. All right. Uh, so, and a lot of people wonder uh, what are the entry requirements? And we, we often talk about general entry requirements and specific entry requirements. The general entry requirements, now we're talking for masters, uh, is that you would have a bachelor's degree, but you still can apply uh, if you are in the last year of your undergraduate uh, studies. So you don't need to have concluded that, but if you are in the last year, you can apply. If you are uh, in the second year, then you cannot apply, then you will not be eligible. But in the last year, you can apply and then you can submit, you will have then to submit an official letter from your university stating there are you are in the last year and that you have had good results up so far so there is a prediction that you'll be concluding uh, your undergraduate studies by the time you uh, start your master's program here and then uh, there are there are specific entry requirements and those are often connected to the to the main field of study that you will be studying in your master's so if you're applying for a master's in chemistry, it's most likely uh, that the, the specific requirements will be that you have a certain number, either that the, 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 
degree major is chemistry or that you have a certain number of credits in chemistry, for instance. It's just an example, but I hope you get the idea. So it can be that uh, a program would require that you have a certain amount of academic credits in different fields of study or in a specific field of study. So each master's program will have that specified at their web page. Um, so you can find this information easily at the master's programs uh, web pages. And then we come to the English language proficiency. Uh, so what it is required of me when it comes to English? Uh, there are three things that you need to think about. Uh, you could meet the English requirements through your upper secondary studies uh, from some countries. So uh, when we go through the web pages uh, later on, uh, you can see at the university admissions, there will be specific information from your country of study. It's important that you look in this area when you're looking to submitting your documents, because over there, you, you are going to see that whether you fulfill the, the entry requirements for English or not with your, uh, with your upper secondary uh, studies. If you don't, then you can go to the next step. The next step would be to check if you fulfill the, the requirements for English through academic studies. And then there will be specified a list of uh, kinds of and, and countries for academic studies that would then grant you uh, the eligibility in English. And if you don't fulfill the eligibility uh, in English uh, through academic studies either, then you can do a test. Also, everyone can be uh, proved the eligibility in English through a test, but sometimes a test is not required. So it's important that you check what is specific for your country of studies because those tests are expensive. So if you can avoid doing that, uh, it's better, right? Uh, and IELTS and TOEFL are the most, most common tests, but we also accept, accept Cambridge. And there's, there, there is a list at university admissions uh, in, towards what, which tests we accept for English eligibility. And in red there, you can see plan ahead. Uh, remember that there is a deadline to submitting uh, supporting documents by February 1st. So the English tests uh, should be submitted by this date as well. And so it's important to plan if you need to do an English test. Okay, but we've been talking about requirements, requirements, but what does requirement means for me? Uh, I have, uh, for instance, uh, academic studies from Brazil and high school studies from Brazil. Uh, do I fulfill the requirements the same way as uh, a person that has academic studies from uh, Canada? Uh, it might be different. I might not have the eligibility in English from my upper secondary studies, but the person coming from Canada uh, will have that. So it is, again, important that you check at university admissions uh, what are the instructions when it comes to requirements for your specific country of study. All right. Yeah. So this is just a recap, uh, perhaps, uh, or just a, a step by step uh, on how you do the application. So the first thing uh, you have to go to university admissions .se and create an account. When you have created the account, uh, then you would choose uh, the programs and courses that you want to apply for. So if you're applying for master's programs, you have to, you can choose up to four programs. Uh, if you're applying for uh, undergraduate programs, uh, then you can choose up to eight courses and programs. And then when you have chosen uh, what you're going to be applying for, you will have to rank those uh, courses and programs uh, in a way that you put the one that you want the most as your first priority and so on and so forth. Because if you get selected to your first priority, all the other uh, courses that, are, that have a lower priority, they will be deleted. 
uh, the programs. Uh, so when it comes to programs, it's like that. So it's important that you really, really think about oh, which one do I really, really want? And then you put that as a first priority, all right? And then you have to pay. Uh, can you go back, uh, Petra, a little bit? Uh, perhaps, I don't know uh, if we talked about that, uh, because uh, Christopher talked about tuition fee. Uh, and people, they are uh, obliged to pay tuition fee. Uh, it's most likely that they will have to pay uh, an application fee as well. Uh, so there is uh, at university admissions and at our web page as well, uh, there will be information about uh, citizenship, citizenship within which countries uh, have to pay uh, uh, tuition fee and the application fee, and uh, as well as the exceptions. The supporting documents then, uh, remember the date, February 1st is the deadline for su uh, submitting your supporting documents. Uh, and the most common documents that you will have to submit if you're applying for masters, uh, it's uh, the official uh, transcript of records uh, that you have from your university studies, a diploma or a certificate that you have concluded your studies, if you have concluded them. Uh, if you don't, you need to send a, a letter from your university if you're in your final year stating that you are uh, registered as a student and so on. Uh, the proof of English proficiency, uh, additional documents that your program might require. Uh, for instance, we have artistic uh, programs that require a portfolio and so on. So by then uh, you, you need to check if you need to submit those documents to university admissions or to another uh, platform because it could be different. So double check that. Uh, some uh, programs that we have require that you have um, uh, GMAs, for instance, so you have to check how you have to re uh, submit those. And then a page of your passport uh, with a picture. Um, so you just scan it and then submit a P PDF so that we can verify your nationality and then assess whether you need to pay application and tuition fee or not. I hope I haven't forgotten anything. Uh, so now I think I, I took a lot of time to explain those things. So I see that there are a lot of questions coming in. So I don't know how should I do that? Should I show the web page through um, questions, Petra, or should I just uh, start navigating and showing? How do we organize this? Yes, maybe you can navigate and. Uh... I'll just have to stop. We did have stop one sharing. question in the um, Q and A that mm -hmm. maybe you can take. It was from Gius Giuseppe that asked, uh, "How much time does it usually take for the university admission website to verify your support documents, including your ID card, which verifies that you are a citizen from the EU?" Uh, that that can vary a lot. Uh, so what I would suggest is that if you have all the documents, don't wait until the deadline to submit, uh, because uh, things like nationality and so on, there is also a deadline to pay the tuition fee and uh, and a deadline to pay the application fee from for uh, above all. So uh, if I would show you here, we are at to university admissions dot at C. Uh, do you guys see my screen? Just give us the head, the heads up. Um, yes, it looks fine. That's great. So then you have dates and deadlines here, uh, and then we're gonna we are talking now about autumn semester dates, right? So you see here uh, the application fee deadline is also February first. Uh, so this is one once they have processed uh, and identified that you. Uh, has to that you have to or or don't have to uh, pay the application fee uh, they would have to have checked your nationality so the the, the earlier you submit your nationality documents uh, the better because then you you can have already assessed by this time well uh, this person has or doesn't have to pay the application fee 
I hope I answered the question. I think you did a great job. Mm -hmm. uh, we have one other question about from John about countries of primary language of study in English that are required uh -huh. and uh, regarding English tests. Okay. So uh, I'm gonna show you again. Uh, I don't know if you guys are putting links on the um, Q&A or the chat, but university admissions. And then uh, if you scroll down, uh, way down, then you see English requirements here, right? So you can click there. And here there will be exactly as I told you, three steps towards assessing whether you need to have a, an English test or not. So the first one through upper secondary uh, studies. And then what happens is that you will find your country of study at the required document page. Okay, uh, find your country of study at the requirement document page. And then here you select, you click on that link and you select your country of study. So let's say uh, a person coming from uh, Bulgaria, uh, Let's do it again. Uh, I actually, I'm gonna uh, choose USA because you said English speaking country, right? So we take USA. Um, uh, there, United States of America. And then there will be a list of, oh, how do I meet the English requirements if I have uh, studies from this country? Do I do that uh, through upper secondary studies? Yes, if you completed all four years of high school, you fulfill the English requirements. So you don't need to go any further when it comes to English. What you need to do then is to submit your, the, the supporting documents for your high school studies. Uh, okay, what happens then? Uh, how do I submit my documents? Then you still have to, on the same page, there will be information about how to submit your documents for for instance, from USA, the university or the high school needs to send the documents straight to university admissions. So some countries, they cannot upload the documents. Uh, they need to send the documents in a different way. So that's why I said it's very important that you, uh, when you, when you have doubts about the English requirements and so on, always look uh, and how to submit your documents, always look in this page that is called country instructions. I hope I answered the question. Uh, let me know if I was missing something. I don't know, I don't hear anything. David? I think it was clear. Oh, okay. Yeah, thank you, Francine. <laughs> So uh, while uh, I don't know if there are any questions, any more questions in the chat, but I'll, I will just show you the UMI University, right? Uh, how the pages are interconnected, as I said. So if you go to UMI University webpage uh, and then you click on this link here, education. Uh, and here you can search courses and programs by a keyword, uh, by selecting the semester. So it's, uh, it, you can filter through this, but if I will go straight to master programs here, then I will get the selection for all of the master programs that we have with English as the language of instruction, which is 42. Uh, and then I can filter by uh, field of study. So I'm interested in mathematics, technology, and IT. So I click there and then I will see that, okay, uh, 14 programs of those 42 uh, have something related to those fields. And then I click on master, uh, master's programs in artificial intelligence. You see that there is apply now. Uh, so once I have read everything that is informing me uh, about this program, and then I scroll down uh, and I see the program overview, and then I scroll down a little bit more, I see career opportunities. And then I will see uh, both the eligibility requirements uh, and the selection criteria. And then there will be an apply now button here as well. And when I click there, it leads me straight to university admissions. So this is what I meant when I said the pages are uh, interconnected. And have I started searching for my programs and courses here at university admissions? 
uh, let's say I knew about this program or I just found this program there. Uh, and then let me see. I don't even remember which one I saw. Master's programs in artificial intelligence. Okay. Uh, and then there. Oh, it's not actually. Uh, I just say artificial. Artificial intelligence is a field that I'm interested in. And then I see, oh, there is a master's uh, program at Ume University. And then I want to know more about it. And then I can click here and it will take me straight to Ume University webpage. So it doesn't matter where you start your search, uh, as long as you come to Ume. <laughs> All right, uh, I don't know if there are any more questions at the Q&A, something yes, that I Yes, I think share. there are several yes. questions. Mm -hmm. David, maybe you can say There was them. one, there was kind of a long question. I, um, I can read it off. Uh, mm. Hi, I am applying for a master's program and I am currently finishing up a two-year masters to be completed in July. The program I, I am applying to selects the students based on ECTS. Mm -hmm. My question is, how do I document that I obtained, obtained these credits? Do I just document it as a transcript? I was also wondering if the selection is based on, based on credits is based on the amount obtained by the submission deadline. Exactly. Uh, I don't know which pro do you know which program you're applying for, uh, if you can tell it, but I, I will give you uh, an example exactly by uh, the program that I'm showing right now at the screen. Uh, so here, uh, if the selection process, uh, cr selection criteria is based on academic credits completed by the last application date, which I think is what you found in the program that you're applying for, this means exactly as you understood uh, is totally correct. Uh, it would be based on the amount of academic credits that you have completed by the last application date. So for instance, if your country is not within the ECTS system, we are going to convert that to ECTS. So just that you will have an idea, uh, a bachelor's program in Sweden is equivalent to 180 ECTS which is equivalent of uh, three years of studies full-time. Uh, so if you have a bachelor from another country, it is most likely that this will be translated into 180 ECTS. Or if you are in the last year of studies, uh, then will be a little bit less. And, and when it states in the range of 30 to 285, this means that well, you can compete with a minimum of 30 ECTS and a maximum of 285. Uh, what happens uh, if uh, you exceed 285, you cannot use those credits for competition. So this is the, the top uh, of, uh, there is a top of the rank. This is uh, the highest amount of credits you can compete with. So what happens if all of the participants, if, if the, the amount of credits is uh, 285 for the last person to come in, but there are a lot of people with 285, then we'll, that will be a lottery, right? So this is how it works, unless something else is specified. And if something else is specified, it will be specified at the program's webpage. Yes. Thank mm -hmm. you. I just read that this this question was from a student that is applying to the public health one year program. Yeah, uh, so it, it's probably uh, the same uh, selection criteria. So a lot of people, especially people coming from the US and, and uh, so uh, there's a lot of focus on the grades, how good grades that you have got. Uh, and this basically means uh, that the selection process is not taking your grades in consideration. So it's taking the amount of academic credits that you, are, that you have studied. So it could be that a person with very good grades will be in the same uh, patamar of, level of competition of a person with 
uh, average grades, uh, but if the person with average grades has more credits, uh, the, that person is in advantage. So I hope I have answered uh, your question. Please let me know if you're missing any information. Hi, Francine. I can see that there is one more question here. Yes. If I applied a one-year master program, can I extend to two years after I decide? Um, mm -hmm. It depends on the program. Um, uh, uh, public health, for instance, we have uh, one and two years. So it's most likely that the information will be at the program's web page. Um, and a lot of people ask also the, the, the question the other way around. If I apply for a two-year master's and, and decide to give up, can I just have one-year master's instead? So take a look at the web page uh, for the program. And uh, if the information is not there, uh, just please, uh, if you scroll down at the program web page, there will be uh, a contact form and then you can write your question there because then uh, we direct the question to the program responsible of or the study counselor at the program so someone that can answer the question more specifically uh, i would also like to show you uh, that uh, i'll just bring it here uh, now I'm scrolling down a lot. Uh, at Ume University's webpage, uh, you can also uh, find the webpage for uh, study counseling. Um, if you go here, let's see where it is. It's not here. I need to learn uh, the way for this, but I'll just do it like this. And I'll change to English. Uh, so uh, umu.sc uh, and then the, the English web page, and then you go to education, student service, and support and guidance. Uh, or you just search for general study guidance. And through this web page, uh, you can find at this section all the possible ways to contact us. Uh, and we do uh, offer digital uh, drop-in and digital uh, meetings uh, or telephone meetings. But if you are abroad, the best situation is that you book a digital meeting because then we can address all specific questions that you may have towards your uh, application. All right, so feel free. Uh, it doesn't cost anything. None of our services costs anything and you're gonna get good guidance. All right. Uh, I don't know. Any more questions? Okay, we, we're um, we're still here, and if you have any questions, feel free to uh, submit them in the Q and A. Mm -hmm. um, we're here to answer them. We've had a lot of good questions from everyone. And I wonder if Christopher is still here and can answer some questions. I am still here, yes. Okay. Um, so we have a, a question regarding the uh, SI scholarships um, regarding uh, who does select the master's program from Omen Uni University that are available in the Swedish Institute scholarships and when does that happen? Do you know that? That is me and Ingrid, or more more likely Ingrid, my colleague, uh, together with our, our uh, boss. And we are in the process now of sending in those programs to the Swedish Institute. I do not have more information at this moment, however. Okay, and what programs? Yes, but they will, in the next couple of weeks, probably be published on the SI scholarship webpage. Am I correct? That is correct. Thank you. And I just added a link to the web page that Francine was showing. To get in touch with our talented study advisors. Yes, and I just added one before and I forgot to write before, but it's to the SI scholarships where you can read more 
you can also read about the countries that um, you have to live in to be able to apply. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I can just uh, mention again, it's uh, the application deadline is the 16th of January. So you have plenty of time to prepare your applications, get all your documents in order. And the best thing to do is submit everything so that it's accurate and that you have your tuition fee paid if you need to pay that uh, instead of going back in after. Yeah, the, the deadlines are really important. Of course, we, we always uh, suggest that if you have gathered all the documents that you would submit them straight away, please do that. But the most important thing is not to miss the deadline. So, because if you submit, oh, I, I only uh, uploaded the documents on February the 2nd, and, and then your application will be considered as a late application. So you, you, you just missed the opportunity to be considered for the, the selection round and the regular uh, selection process. So don't miss the deadline. Uh, put a, um, a calendar in the fridge or something like that. So you uh, in your mobiles and so on, so that you don't miss it. And of course, if you have any questions, uh, get in touch with us. Um, so we will try to help you. We have a question mm -hmm. uh, from a student that is an undergraduate student who hasn't completed his his or her final year of studies. Mm -hmm. And the um, it mentions that they have to provide a list of courses that they are taking in their final year. He wants to know, he or she wants to know if this list document needs to be officially stamped by his university. Uh, yes, uh, it has to be an official document from uh... Let's just bring it here. Uh, and I'll show you where to find the information. Uh, final year of bachelor study. So university admissions, I'll just say the, the whole path, <laughs> apply to masters, provide application documents, final year of bachelor studies. Uh, I don't know, wh where are you guys putting the links? Uh, do I need to send you this, uh, um, David? Or are you just putting in the chat or in We're the, putting them in the chat. Um, I can do chat. this. Okay. I'll finally hear bachelor. Uh, so here you find uh, uh, specifics about uh, what is this uh, official documentation and how you need to submit. So submit an official document stating that you are currently enrolled student and participating in your last year of studies. The document must be issued, issued through this uh, and signed by the representative of academic rep and so on and so forth. So the information is there. So yes, it needs to be signed. Just get that link. So Francine, mm -hmm. uh, while um, um, waiting, um, there's another question about the, the bachelor's business program. Uh, mm -hmm. okay. the, dif the differences uh, with an economics program and how much math is involved. How important is mm -hmm. it to be good at maths for the business program? Okay, uh, I'll just bring the program to the page just a second. Yes. Uh, that I just closed the page. Education, and then we go to undergraduate programs and then international business and economics. Okay, so when you apply for undergraduate studies, uh, the, the documents and the selection criteria are different. Uh, so you forget about what I said, uh, selection by academic credits. The, result, the selection would be based on your uh, results from high school or upper secondary studies or this national university aptitude test. And this national university aptitude test is something that you can only do in Sweden uh, and sometimes in Finland. Uh, so it's kind of... Um, it's hard for international students to, to submit this uh, result for the National University Aptitude Test. So most of the international students, they only rely on their grades from high school. 
which will in this case be 60 percent of the seats that we have for this program will go for people competing with their high school results right so this is the selection when it comes to the uh, eligibility it's gonna be based on the subjects that you have been studying during your high school uh, so what happens is that they're going to take your country of studies and they're going to also translate the grades and the, the subjects into the Swedish system. So you need to have general, general entry requirements, which is uh, that you have concluded your upper secondary studies. Um, and then you will also need uh, the equivalent of the Swedish upper secondary courses, English 6, Mathematics 3B or 3C, uh, or Civics, and so on and so forth. What happens? At university admissions, uh, some of the countries, they will have uh, like a, a table uh, showing these equivalences, but not all of the countries. Uh, because they haven't translated into uh, publicly for all of the countries. So what you need to do is to submit your high school uh, records uh, with the transcripts from the courses that you took during your high school and the diploma. And then we will assess and tell you how much mathematics is. Uh, so do you have mathematics three or do you have uh, to complete with that later on? I hope I have answered the question. Uh, but when it comes to the, the program itself, yeah, there is a lot of mathematics because there are economic modeling with applications. Uh, there are business analytics. So this is why the requirement that the person has uh, a, uh, a certain knowledge within the mathematical field in order to be able to conclude uh, the courses that are, are going to be given in the scope of this program specifically. So. Great, Francine. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering if anyone perhaps uh, might have any questions for Gwen. Yes. Yes. I have a question for Gwen, which is, uh, I've never seen anyone so excited about the winter. <laughs> <laughs> That's really cool. It's not a question, it's a statement. That is really cool. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, you're the person to ask about the winter activities and things to do, uh, which is really nice. I think it's often a, a daunting thing, especially for a lot of international students. It might be a reason why people are maybe less likely to come here because they're a bit scared of how to experience it. But I think once you get used to it, the first week is always a bit shocking, but once you get used to it and once you learn how to kind of survive it, it's it's really beautiful. I really love the way that Umia continues on, even when there's about this much snow and ice everywhere, life keeps on going, which is great. Uh, this is also something that I was really impressed by. I, I mean, I've been living here. I'm not from Sweden, as you probably know by now, uh, by my accent, but I'm not from the U.S. either. And uh, what I've heard, you know, I have a brother that lived in the U.S. in the Colorado uh, region. And then uh, whenever there was a snowstorm or a little more snow, he would say, oh, we are free from school. Everything stopped. The traffic is chaotic. And this in my 20 years in Sweden, it happened only once. Only once, uh, never, I, I, my kids never stopped for school or myself. When I was at university, I never missed a class because it was snowing or the traffic wasn't working because it was snowing. They have people working 24 seven, just like uh, plugging snow and, and taking out of the way and throwing, uh, you know, it's really in, impressive infrastructure that they have here. I can I can second that. I'm mm -hmm. uh, I'm from the United States, and mm -hmm. I can say we we get plenty of snow up here, and life goes on as usual. It's yes. just like a normal day. They plow the roads, they plow the the pedestrian and bike paths, and uh, you will see people bicycling year round, even in the snow. And mm -hmm. it's it's safe, and it's it's cozy outside and warm inside, as we like to say. Um, our buildings are well heated 
Mm-hmm. And it's very cozy, actually. It's a this is a cozy time of the year. Um, before we know it, the Christmas lights will be out, and uh, it's really a, it's an exotic place to be. Mm-hmm. It is. Yeah, I was thinking maybe we should round up now since there are no more questions. Perhaps all of us who have been here today maybe can say like something why you should choose Umi University to study here. Is that a good thought? Sounds great. Yes. Who wants to start? I can begin. If you come to Umi University, you are going to have a great time and meet people from all over the world. And it's really amazing. This town in Northern Sweden is very international. Um, and you'll hear so many language, languages spoken. The, the Swedish and English are the biggest ones, but it's very, very multicultural. And I think you should come to Umeå because uh, it's a very friendly city and with a open environment and really cre- creative uh, campus atmosphere. So warmly welcome. Yes, I think the best uh, about the city itself is the mixture of uh, a rich cultural life with lots of festivals and a big music scene together with uh, an amazing landscape. And uh, you can do lots of winter activities here, for example, and uh, go hiking, uh, which I love. I can say from a student perspective, uh, you should definitely come study at Umeå because you are so well looked after as a student and not just as an international student, but uh, students here are really cared for and cared about and the university really does its utmost best to answer all your questions and to help you along the way. If you have any issue with anything, you can always email and someone will reply. Uh, It's a great supportive environment, this university, which is really unique. I can only agree with uh, all the others and Gwen especially. It's a very open-minded campus and and university. Also for people from other parts of the world, this is an amazing country. It's an amazing nature, the forest, the mountains, and also the the animals. The elk farm is a must see, I must say. (laughs) It is, I I can second that and uh, everything that you said. Uh, But for me, sometimes I wonder, so being living here for 20 years, I have both the the student perspective and the employee perspective and and my personal perspective as a mother and so on. But uh, what I would say uh, as a student at the university, it's very informal. Uh, The structure of the studies is completely different from what I have experienced before. You, you, You can focus at one thing at a time. You don't need to, most of the programs they actually have a structure where you study one subject at a time uh, instead of studying five subjects and then have a, a, a test week at the end of the semester. So you can do one course and then you can uh, get your tests and, and, and uh, essays on that course and then the course is finished, but somehow they interconnect and they, they put things together and there's always a holistic perspective. Yeah, what I also thought it was different is the amount of, um, how do you say, autonomy uh, and uh, responsibility that you have towards uh, your studies, because there is a lot of self-studies, there is a lot of discussions in group, uh, and because the, the, the classroom is such a rich environment with people from all over the world, you get so many different perspectives on the subjects that are being discussed. And, and, and this is also something that we get as staff. You know, here there's a person from Brazil, from the US, from the UK, and, and, and so on, and, and, and Swedish. So a lot of things happen and you get, you changed, you, you'll be changed in a deeper level that you would think. That's what I would say. Hmm? Great, so... Thank you, everyone, for joining today. Thanks, everyone. And we certainly welcome an application from you. And wish you all the best of luck. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye, everyone.